Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Learning Animation in Source Filmmaker. This is part two, and uh, since we did something relatively non-complex, we did a ball bounce last time, I figured we should just jump straight into the absolute hardest thing to possibly ever do in animation, and that's a walk cycle. <laughs> Walking is uh, very much a human motion, so let's load in a human. Okay. Uh, let's load in the most basic human we can possibly load in. There he is. He's just so nondescript. And everybody uses him, but everybody uses him because he's just kind of nothing. Now, as I'm getting the scout set up for this, it's going to give me a good opportunity to talk about the kind of bone structure he has, right? Uh, the kind of setup that he has. So what this is called, this is called an FK, or Forward Kinematic Setup, where um, each bone is sort of driven by the bone directly above it, and it's just like you're manipulating a fun skeleton, and that's all good and dandy, but the thing about it is that it becomes very difficult to make things consistent, like you have to be like, what, where was that before? There's one simple solution to that, and it's a solution that's pretty much used by uh, everyone. If you right click here, go to Rig, and then go to Rig Biped Simple, which is the usual for the TF characters, you can turn him into a rigged character, which uses what's called IK, or Inverse Kinematics, where instead of this driving it, it's now being driven by this, which means that if I pull this up, and if I move this around, it will pull the rest of it around as well. And that is mostly controlled through this, which is a pole vector, or, or rig knee, or rig elbow here, which we'll be able to use to kind of direct where that's pointing. Um, this also applies it to the arms, um, which provides a unique challenge in that while this is super valuable for the legs, it is less valuable for the arms, because now if I were to pull him forwards, the legs don't move which is fantastic and exactly what we need. The arms don't move either, and this can lead to, well, well a, lot of, a lot of fun situations, but it's going to be a bit of a challenge when I'm um, doing walk cycles and such. This usually doesn't bother me, I just kind of pull them along and then I animate them later and they look like a big old goofus and that's a fun time, but for now I think what's going to be the best course of action is to go in here to grab the rig hands of both right and left and then take the pelvis drag this down and that will lock them in place and it will effectively parent these things to the pelvis so that now when I move the pelvis I'm moving the uh, I'm moving the um, the hands as well so that's pretty much how you keep things consistent Alright, now this boy's all set up, let's uh, let's get into the, the real brass tacks of the situation. You can't really do a walk cycle tutorial without talking about Mr. Richard Williams. Who is a veteran animator who pretty much wrote the book on walk cycles. He's uh, He was the lead animator for um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and he tried to make his own film entirely, mostly by himself, with his ridiculous level of quality. It took him about 20 years, he never managed to do it, it was butchered, it was... Ugh, yeah, it's it's just a thing. So Richard Williams, he's, he's a good boy. And I highly recommend his book, The Animator's Survival Kit. Oh yeah, as a fun bonus, I've uh, found a free PDF version of The Animator's Survival Kit, and I've put it in the description, so enjoy which uh, contains absolutely nothing but good advice, except for maybe, maybe that part. That's that's probably a bit... Yeah, I listen to music all the time when I'm animating. Um, it's the only way I can really drown out the void. Anyway, so, the reason why people like his <sighs> talks on walks so much is because he takes something that is actually very complex and breaks it down into something extremely simple, as you can probably see here. This is a walk. And while I'm sort of punching in these poses, 
I'll also talk at length about kind of why we needed to simplify it so much. And that mostly comes down to the way that humans effectively move through space. So, if we were to put him in the contact pose now. Contact pose is always a good place to start. Walk is essentially a controlled fall. And humans move by, uh, by falling. They fall and then their legs catch them. So, let's just say we want this boy to move forwards. Ooh. So he'll move forwards. And let's say we'll pull him about like five ahead. He'll move forwards like that, and it's like, well, yeah, he's moving. Oh, Jesus, there's nothing to catch him. Oh, no. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, God. And then, yeah, that happens. Easy solution to that is, if I were to pull these back because I didn't start at zero, what if a leg caught? What if this happened? So, now we're in this situation, like so. Uh, this is probably not the best way to start, but it, it kind of illustrates what I'm going for here. Um, people walk by catching themselves as they fall, and they do this subconsciously without even realizing it. In fact, just try to walk. You will start to feel yourself fall forwards, and then your leg will immediately stretch forwards and catch it, and then you'll just carry on from there. Once you have built up that momentum, it's a lot easier to... It's a lot easier to just keep moving. So, if I were to put this boy in his correct pose... Kind of... Yeah. So, when we have the contact down, the contact is when the foot stops the person from falling. Then we have a down. I don't usually do the down, but for the sake of arguments, I will show you this. So, the down is the person's weight being essentially caught by the foot. And then pushing it downwards. And as this is happening, this back foot here, which no longer has any weight on it, is starting to release. This is a horrible down, but I'm doing this quickly and I don't really care. Alright. Punch this another four frames forwards. And then we get the pass position. The pass position is extremely important because this is the moment where effectively this foot passes this one and prepares to catch the next fall. Oh dear, I really should have updated that, but like, uh, I should have, I should have changed the default pose from his just like you know, a pose. In fact, hmm. oh yeah, another thing I should probably note: um, what we did with the bouncing ball exercise, where you're just animating one thing at a time, that is essentially what you do in 3D animation. So if you are concerned about, oh, I just animated a bouncing ball, how am I supposed to move to animating an entire person? That's a lot more than just a ball. He's made up of balls. Look at him. He's full of balls. That's a ball. These are all balls. It's just, just go all balls out, baby. All right, so we got our pass. And then we move into the up. So let's move into an up. I'm not really doing this very correctly, but oh well. This is what you asked for. Alright, so now we have the up. At this point in time, he's pushed his weight upwards from the pass position, so he's used the momentum from the down to push himself up. And I think I might be able to illustrate that a little better if I just were to do that. Now, he's about to fall back into a contact. So let's pull him forwards and pull him into a contact. If you're not entirely sure how this is supposed to go, what the hint here really is, is that the base walk that you do 
is sort of like a wave function. Why do they say function? I swear. I swear I'm not one of those people. Alright. Yeah. So, for argument's sake, let's just put him into a nice wave. That looks a little better. Except that's... Yep, that's pretty much exactly where we want it. Let's pull it back a bit so the leg has more room to breathe. Or let's not. Truth be told, I should be using these toe bones, but I really can't be bothered, so I, I won't. Mm. Uh, uh. So, let's put you into the position of the up, where this leg swings ahead, ready to catch the weight of the scout. And then the contact, it catches. We move it into this position. So yeah, that's a walk. That's uh, that's. Oh boy. As you can see, there is a lot of room for uh, refining. So we can do that by just adjusting the spacing of where we've put stuff. If we pull things forwards and backwards, might be able to see some kind of a result coming out. It's uh, it's not, it's not great, but here's where we get into the better part, and we'll do that after we've punched in just another another cycle. So Another contact. And the fun part about that is that we can just go back to our previous contact here and just replicate it. And just try to be like, okay, so that's there and that's there, that's the approximate distance we want. Um, yeah, we can just. And there you have a walk, according to Richard Williams. We've got a bit of a weird bump here. Um, so the best way to fix that is just to pull that down. And as you may notice, there's some slight discrepancy in timing. But overall, yep, yep, that's, that's the most basic ever walk you could do. So, the next question we should ask ourselves is if we followed these instructions to a T, why does it still look like hot garbage? Um, I'm pretty sure one of them is on my end of the spectrum because what the heck? Yeah. So you may look at that and you may think, yeah, that's that's pretty good for a start. You know, he's a stompy boy. And now we get into the fun part. You see, the reason why the animated survival kit is so so good. It's because not only does he sort of explain this, he continues to explain walking and run cycles for a further 60 pages. He very much emphasizes that this is the absolute base, and um, from here you can experiment and create new things. Which is why I usually completely forget to do the down and I move directly from the contacts into the past pose. So, theoretically, let's say I dragged all of this back one frame. So this would become an interval of three rather than an interval of four. So let's just do that real quick. I'm not really judging this based on overall distance, more on sort of like... I base a lot of my distance based on just the approximation of the space between the keyframes, and from there I can sort of tell a lot. But yeah, let's pull all that together. And then let's check to see what our boy looks like now. Well, that looks a lot more plausible. He's still stompy, but he looks a lot more plausible. Hmm. Now, 
let's see if we can modify this a bit further. And let's see if we can just, in general, remove... I mean, the reason why you look so stompy is because I've exaggerated this curve so much. So, let's just go to the point where we can still have a visible thing. We can still have, like, a visible wave. But we pull it up to the point where the leg is straight. We do that for the next part as well. So we get less of a stompy motion. More of a steppy motion. Now let's take a look. I mean, it's already looking a lot better, but... God damn. He's stepping like those heels are Gucci. So... Let's figure out what could possibly be the cause for that. I think it may have something to do with the fact that it's not moving as much as it should. So let's pull this a bit forward and make it start the... Make it start the pass just a little bit earlier. So now... That looks a bit more natural. So let's do the same on this one. Let me see if I can find a uh, better example of what we're going for. Okay, so I, uh, I changed the... He's got, he's got arms now. We're not going to be focused on the arms just yet. Because... Right now, it doesn't look too bad. You know, he's walking. He's walking. He's talking. But it looks kind of unnatural in a way, doesn't it? Like, the, just the way he moves perfectly straight forwards. And, um... It goes into the next part. You see... A lot of believable animation really comes down to the movement of the pelvis. The pelvis is, I would argue, the most important part of any animation ever. And that's because we're just, we're so used to it that we don't really even notice it. So when we see something that doesn't have a lot of pelvic movement, when we see something that just doesn't really sort of convey any kind of weight transition, it looks unnatural and strange. But let's say if we were to recognize that when he goes down on this leg, the weight would shift to this direction before coming back down again. And then when it falls onto this leg here, where we have the contact as the very center of gravity, the center of gravity will shift onto this leg in order to prevent it, in order for the scout to prevent himself from falling over. Let's see what this now looks like with that wave in there. It looks a little, a little more natural, doesn't it? And this, this all comes down to one thing that I learnt from a, um, a stop-motion book, which was written by Ardman, who are, you know, the creators of Wallace and Gromit and all that sort of good stuff. And they pointed out one thing, and that is, try to walk forwards while keeping your, while keeping your pelvis perfectly centred, and it will feel like the weirdest thing that you will ever have to do. And that's pretty much for this exact reason is that all the time, us humans, we are always, always doing some form of weight transition in order to prevent ourselves from falling over. Mostly it comes down to control over your center of gravity. And the best way to illustrate control over the center of gravity is through manipulation of the pelvis. Hmm. So yeah, that's a, that's a very Always, always prioritize pelvic movement whenever you're um, doing re really anything. Re really anything. Yeah, um, Elvis Elvis got it right the first time, for sure. That's, that's why the US government had to neutralize him. Let's move into putting the hands in here, which I believe will start to make it feel a lot more natural. So, this man's got a hand. And as this dictates here, the hands will counterbalance the movement of the legs. So any point where the leg is in front, the hand will always be behind. 
So well, we can just punch these in one at a time, or we can punch these in together, which I think might be the better idea. So we'll just have him move just like that. Alright, so we have keys on both of these. Now let's move forward three and let's readjust. Following along, see if that actually works. I doubt that's going to work, but I'll see what happens. I'll see if that looks natural. Um, anima animation comes down to a lot of experimentation, and 3D animation is really good for this because you can change everything on the fly. You can go back, and nothing, nothing is permanent, like I said before. I mean, that, that looks like weird and quick, so here's what we're going to do instead. I'm going to pull this forwards, and then the down here is going to be, the arm's going to remain in very much the same position as it was here, but what's going to happen is that taking into account that in a cycle the arm is always swinging, this arm has swung this way, and as it swings, this part of the hand is going to go backwards. Now, why would it go backwards? It mostly comes down to physics, and Richard Williams will illustrate that in the um, animated survival kit as well. But as this, is, as this has now reached its position where it needs to be, this part of the hand will now start to swing forwards because it will take the previous like rotation motion of where it was, and it will then proceed to follow through on it. So now, since we're now pulling that back a bit too much, we can take this and we can pull that just a bit in the opposite direction. And now what that will illustrate is a much more natural motion than say, if we were to just uh, keep this thing perfectly straight. So let's, let's do that. Let's keep it perfectly straight and see how it looks. Because it'll look like a wooden board. Yep. No movement. No motion. All fun. Officially banned. Nah. We don't want that. We want to get silly. So let's get silly. Here's one of my number one... Well, not really one of my number one top tips. It's one of my definite top tips, and that is wherever you get the opportunity to do any kind of follow-through, do it. It will make things look a lot more fluid and a lot more flowy. And that's kind of what you want in animation. The last thing you want is something that looks stilted and bad. So let's pull you three frames forwards, and then let's pull you up to the next position, which is going to be just around here and we'll start to lessen that out now because it's moving less intensely and now if we pull this another three forward we should find ourselves in the opposite position of this where this is now pulled back and we can pull this just a little bit forward like that in fact let's go over here and let's just Hmm. Oh, I know what we can do. We can take this and we can pull it forward like this. Now it will look like that. So his arm will now swing backwards. Into this position here. I'll just pull this down so it's got like a more straight arm. Richard Williams illustrates the importance of this by using a pendulum as an example, where a pendulum will always start out slow and then move very quickly to its next position and then sort of hang there for a bit. 
before gravity pulls it back down again uh, through another arc. So let's take this down here and let's pull this part of the hand backwards because now that's taking that motion through here and following through on it. And now we get that motion. So let's punch in even more. It's the down that's kind of throwing me off because I don't actually usually have downs in my animations. Like, animation is a tough process and it takes a long time, so you cut corners where ever you can really get away with. And uh, I, I would say probably don't listen to that advice if you're in a professional context. But if you're working by yourself and you just want to have fun, um, absolutely. Just don't, don't even bother with it. I'm curious, what if I were to copy and paste this, would I actually... Yes, it would actually work. Huh, that's good. You can't do that on these feet, because as you can see here, it's moving through space. So, say I were to be like, oh, it's so easy, I'll just grab this one, I'll just duplicate it, I'll put it... Oh, God! No, don't bother with that one. The reason why it works on the arms is because of these locks. The reason why I can copy and paste these movements over and over and over again is because... Oh, actually, no, wait, here's because the, uh, the pelvis has stopped moving. Yeah. I can do that because it's not actually... It's being carried by the pelvis because it's parented. Yeah, so there's our arm movement. And I said I was going to punch these in both arms at the same time. I was um, doing what we call in the biz, uh, lying. And now we have arm swings. And then that kind of like throws itself downwards. Let's not do that. And just because I think the current posing is a tad ridiculous, and let's just reduce it a little bit. Okay, now we're getting one of my favorite source filmmaker things. Every now and then, SFM will suddenly decide to take your keys and be like, hmm, these are nice adjustments they were in. Would you like them to be linear? To which you say, please stuff off. Well, yep, let's do the same to this other foot here. Let's just make this a bit less ridiculous. Scout's a funny, cartoony guy. Any source filmmaker person will tell you. You, you put you put the scout in. He's like he's like the funny weenie man. Um, yeah, already that looks so much better. You see, you don't have to listen to the rules all the time. In fact, one of the main tenets of animation is once you understand the basics, you can break as many rules as you want. Now our man's here is still staying perfectly straight up wide, upright in terms of rotation, which is strange and I don't really understand it. So let's add some rotation to the pelvis. So what's going to happen here is as this falls forward, his center of gravity is going to tip forward and then it's just going to slowly return back to normal. So let's see how that looks. And now if we grab the rotation things here, don't grab the position, just 
describes rotation. And we take all of these keyframes and then just copy them again. We'll add that same rotation to the next part. Now, if you can notice something, it's that he's oddly jerky around where he sort of moves into the down. Uh, best way to fix that is to just take these parts and then just tip them forward a little bit. So we're dealing with rotation X here and that looks a little bit freaking weird. So let's just readjust the curves so they look slightly nicer. That should be fine. So yeah, now he just kind of ducks back down again. Usually if something's looking awry, you should check your graph editor and see if the splines look like garbage, because if they do, that's, that's probably why. So let's get a bit more movement in his spine. So let's say as this is the contact, we'll say that that will move back a bit Actually, no, it'll move forward. And then, as we step up and move to the up position, which is this one. We'll have the spine kind of returning to normal before crashing back down to reality on the contact. And if we copy and paste it, we'll see that looks really dumb. But that's not the end, because what's going to happen if we take these and drag these out by two and offset that? What's going to happen is that that's now going to take longer to reach that position, which is going to produce a much more natural motion, like this. As you can see, the scout's now starting to get a bit more swagger in his step. And that's, that's an extreme example, so if we take all that and use this, this is seriously cool. The playhead tool, yeah, you take it and you drag it, and that will soften a bunch of stuff. So it will soften all of that to where it currently, its current position and rotation. So every key you select, it will sort of squash it back down to that position, the ultimate being that it just ends up flat at that position. But yeah, now we've done that, you can start to see he's got a bit more swagger in his step. And it's a lot less subtle. I mean, it's a lot more subtle. And if we were to go forwards and put these in the neck, we can say that as that goes back, And then we'll just move that back to that. Let's see how that looks. This is all experimentation. jamming out. And of course we can soften that. Taking these and pulling them back. Okay. It's probably still a bit too much bounce in your boy. So we'll take those and we'll playhead them down. Before you know it, you got yourself a fairly okay walk cycle. There's a lot more that we could do to this. We could sort of add um, some rotation in the shoulders so that where 
I'm sort of counterbalancing it like that. in him. Yeah. Once you have the base down, any detail that you can add, you can always change on the fly, you can always modify, and don't be afraid to mess up. I have messed up so many times in this tutorial I can't even count. I'm not even sure how I'm an animator at this point. Here are the 12 principles of animation that we covered in this. Follow through. Follow through and overlapping action are pretty much what we did in the hands um, and it deals with the idea that not everything moves at exactly the same time at exactly the same speed as these arms swing in like a pendulum motion the hands themselves almost drag behind and then the second the pendulum motion is complete they're still moving at this pace so they flick upwards Honestly, my improvised explanation of follow through and offset was, um, in a word, a uh, dog shit. So just look at this page of the animated survival kit instead that explains it way better than I ever could. So you can now animate a human walking forwards. And that is something that took a lot of people a very long time to figure out. And it only took you, what, like 30, 40 minutes? Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope somehow it helped. Peace.